the more people that I have giving me accounts of the experience, the more textural, the more structural descriptions I'm going to have. And then what you do, and maybe in another video I might do this, what I do personally, and I, this isn't in the text, but what I do is I, I, I separate the, um, I, I label first for myself, is my question going to elicit um, a textual response? Is my question going to elicit, uh, you don't have to get this deep, but I mean you really should. Is my question going to elicit a structural response? All my textual responses I group, all my structural responses I group, then, and actually I might, well, yeah, might as well do it, right? So you have um, a, a question that's going to elicit what the experience was like, uh, a question that's going to elicit how I, an individual navigated through the experience, and I, I, I separate it, right? So let's say I have an N, let's say my N is of 10. I have an N of 10. I put all my textual, all my textual responses after, after I've transcribed everything. I put all my textual responses on one document, like one PDF or one, you know, Word doc file or whatever the program is you're using. All my textual responses, just block text, all the responses because I know they're textual. And then I put all my structural responses block text on, in, on a separate document, if I could keep my eraser on the board. And then what I do is I read through, and this is just my own, my own method, right? And I'll give you like proper methods, but my own method. Then I read through all of it, and I don't think about anything. And I'm not looking for meaning or significance, just keywords that pop into my mind when I'm reading. Oh, that was interesting, or a key passage, and I'll highlight it. And I'll highlight, I'll go through all the, the, the transcriptions and I'll highlight keywords. Um, someone will say horror, terror, um, you'll never understand, you can't understand, you wouldn't understand, you don't know what I mean, da, 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 and I highlight it. Then I'll go back and I won't read the text, I'll just read the highlighted words. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for, this is my, my method, I think it works well, I mean it worked for me, I'm looking for redundancy. Anytime I see redundancy, redundancy equals a pattern. This is like the bootleg way to do it, right? You don't need to, you know, write a hundred million books to try and figure this out. It's, 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 it's important that you get to a very, very explicit understanding of qualitative research design um, and research methods. Um, but initially, especially at an introductory level, you know, keep it simple, stupid, right? It's like what I want to do is I want to, I want to make sure that I know the nature of my question. I know my question is going to elicit this particular type of response. I group all those types of responses after it's been transcribed into me personally, and I've done this. I put it into one um, document, and I go. Let's say the document is 20 pages after everything's been typed up um, from multiple participants of one type of question, and I go through and I highlight all the keywords. Then I go back, look through, and I don't read it this time. I just read the keywords and key phrases, and then I say, and then for me, this is what I saw. It was like you couldn't understand. You never understand. You wouldn't know what I mean. Different phrases, different ways of putting it, but it all means the same thing for every single participant. For me, there is no coincidence, right? In good research, you don't believe in coincidence. The coincidence needs to be explained. If it's coincidence, then you're doing pretty bad research. Unless your research counts. It's, it's about coincidence, which would be good research, I guess. <laughs> that would be a very good qualitative research uh, question, right? The, the nature of coincidence. Anyway, um, that was way off tangent. But yeah, then I recognized that there was a pattern and everybody was saying that I wouldn't understand. Much to my surprise, I was like, oh my goodness. And I was like, well, there must be something that I just can't understand. And once I recognized that, it changed the, the nature of my interpretation of the phenomena, right? My interpretation of the phenomena completely shifted. Um, and later, I think when we get to grounded theory, we'll talk, uh, unless I've already talked about it, I forget where, but in all research, you have epiphanies. And an epiphany happens where uh, I think I actually talked about it in narrative uh, theory, in narrative uh, research. Um, epiphany will arise because you've created, uh, you've created a discursive space where the participant feels that he or she can speak with you freely, and things that you didn't think, uh, and questions you never thought of, and responses that they never thought they would feel comfortable enough to give, they give, and, and there you have it. So uh, this is sort of my method of uh, organizing my textual and my structural um, descriptions, and I use that to have a better understanding of the essence of the phenomenon. Okay, um, so that's number one still. Now we're on number two. 
Number two is you identify the phenomena you want to study, right? Um, you want to identify some particular phenomena, some particular aspect of the phenomena, right? Um, I have some interests in what I would like to talk about, but now I want to get specific, right? It's not just the case, and this happens all the time. I can't tell you how many times. This happened with me um, as a graduate student a year or two ago, and this happens currently with my graduate students now, uh, and, you know, love all our graduate students, but they'll come in and they'll say, um, hey, Dr. Campbell, I want to do research on blah, 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 some phenomenological study. And I say, well, what's, what's your research uh, interest? And they'll give me a 45-minute discussion on what they want to research. Really, really broad. Yeah, that's a phenomenological question, but as um, uh, my professor, Charles Guillaume, told me, uh, it's, it's better to be very, very, unless the type of research that you're trying to do, um, it's better to be very, very explicit on a very small amount of content than to be very, very general and very, very vague on a large amount of content, right? The whole point of academic research, it's, it's different, right? And people knock it, um, but, you know, you, you might write a 12-page uh, publication in a journal article, some obscure thing that no one will ever read except for other academics. People say, why do you need to do that? I mean, which is a good question, but part of the reason is that as a researcher, I might go back digging through the documents and find this and say, oh, wow, I can not, that opened up a new mode of thinking and I can use that to incorporate in my research. Very, very specific. When it's extremely general, right? When, um, when we're saying, and this is number two, is uh, identify phenomena. Uh, right? We're going to specify the phenomena that we want to study. The more specific... In the most part, it's not always the case, but the most specific, the more specific, the phenomenon that you're trying to study is, the better the type of research, almost invariably, you're going to end up doing. So, in the example of women in um, a domestic shelter, instead of saying that, oh, my phenomenological interest is to, and, and this is a good research topic, right? Um, an introductory research topic, I would say. Um, a student comes to me and says, and this is this is hypothetical. Students haven't come to me and said this, but um, hey, um, Dr. Campbell, I want to. Um, do phenomenological research on women transitioning into um, uh, women's shelters. I'd say, okay, that's that's a good start. Let's get a little bit more specific, right? And then you can get more specific. Okay, not just women trans transitioning into women's shelters, but um, the phenom a phenomenological study of single mothers uh, transitioning into um, into women's shelters or a phenomenological analysis of uh, the levels of poverty among single mothers transitioning into, and so on and so forth, right? So you can see that as I tack on more clauses, in a sense, my, and that's basically all it really is, my, my research topic becomes very, very precise. You might not need your research to be that precise. You might be doing social work and you want a, a very broad sort of segment of the population um, but 9 out of 10 times, it's going to be pretty specific. Um, and the more specific your research is, the greater it generalizes among members of that social demography, right? Um, and, and, and so on. So, um, you really want to specify uh, your research uh, design. You want to, not design, but your, your research interest uh, into what aspect of this and what aspect of this um, phenomenological study uh, is of importance. And sort of the gut question that you ask, you don't really phrase this when the students come to you, but you're sort of like, and you should ask yourself this, right? Same thing that I ask myself is, so what? You know, so who cares? Why, would any, why is it important? So what? You have to answer the so as a, as a student, as a researcher, you should always be asking yourself the so what question. So why is it important that I understand about genocidal intent? I mean, why? Who? So what? Who cares? It's important because da, 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 da. without knowing this, you won't know. Da, 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 da. And not knowing this, you think you know, but you don't know. Da, 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 da. And so on, so on, so on. Right? So you should always sort of give yourself that gut check and say, ask yourself the so what question. Why, why is this important? And in answering that question, what I found in my own research, and again, I always sort of put the disclaimer in, I am a young researcher. I've just really, I'm, I'm in my um, neophyte stage of, uh, my infancy stage of academic research. I do hope to get a lot more qualitative research, tons more qualitative research under my belt. But at this stage, what I've recognized is what's very, very important is for me to be very, very specific, personally, very specific in my research interests 
and to make sure not only that the research that I'm doing is unique and making contributions in a novel way, but um, the analysis and the mode and the method that I set up if I'm doing a phenomenological study, right, that the phenomena itself is something that is explicit. Right? You, don't want, you don't want your phenomena to be something vague or something that people can't relate to. You want it to be very, very specific and something that, for me at least, can, has the possibility of generating huge uh, empathic responses within the population of readers. Because for me, that's, you know, that's what qualitative research is all about.